The Jurassic Coast, located in Dorset and Devon in the south of England, runs for nearly a hundred miles from Studland Bay in the east to Exmouth in the west. A UNESCO World Heritage Site of outstanding universal value, it shares its status with the Grand Canyon and the Great Barrier Reef, giving it special protections and it is considered one of the foremost geology and geomorphology teaching and research resources in the world, along with its internationally significant fossil locations. Whilst generically known as the Jurassic Coast, it in fact consists of different sedimentary rock types from the Mesozoic era, the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous periods, spanning a geological time of approximately 185 million years, ranging from 250 to 65 million years ago. What makes it particularly interesting is the Purbeck monocline, where sedimentary strata that were originally laid down in horizontal layers have been tilted to the near vertical due to the collision of the African and European tectonic plates approximately 30 million years ago, exposing multiple layers and ages of rock. These rock layers of differing hardnesses, clay being soft and limestone and chalk being much harder, are visible at the surface and erode at very different rates. The orientation of the rock layers result in a concordant coastline in some areas and a discordant coastline in others. The concordant coastline has a single rock type, typically running from east to west parallel to the coastline. And the discordant coastline, running north to south, has differing rock types and hardnesses jutting out perpendicular to the coastline. This all leads to some fascinating and varied coastal landforms. Chesil Beach in the west is an example of a 29 kilometre long coastal bar, enclosing a large coastal lagoon, the Fleet. It is formed by the deposition of pebbles and shingle by littoral or longshore drift, where the prevailing southwesterly winds cause the waves to impact on the coast at an angle, slowly picking up and depositing pebbles further down. Some of the pebbles come originally from erosion of mountains in northern France about 240 million years ago and ending up deposited in a thick layer in Devon. The pebbles have been washed out of the East Devon cliffs in the past few thousand years and are now seen on the beach. There are noticeable ridges or steps in the structure showing the heights of various tides with quite a large variation in height in places up to 15 metres. One end of the bar joins the Isle of Portland, forming what was once considered to be a tombolo, but it is now believed to be a barrier beach. There is competition for use of the land here, and sadly the negative impact of some human visitors is clearly visible. At least the waves are strong enough to rearrange any displaced pebbles over a short period of time, something that is not the case with human damage to sand dunes elsewhere, which require very careful management to preserve them. There are, however, areas that have restricted access to allow for bird nesting and to protect some of the more delicate habitats and environments. Fifteen kilometres to the east, along a concordant limestone part of the coastline, is the iconic Durdledore. Erosion of the hard Portland limestone headland over an extended period of time caused notches to be formed. Slowly, these opened up to form a cave, which finally became open at both ends, creating the impressive sea arch we see today. In time, after further erosion, the roof of the arch will collapse, leaving a stack where the part of the arch that stood closest to the incoming waves was located. Also visible here is a wave cut platform, as well as many other notches which result in further erosion of the cliff face. Just to the east of Durdledore is Manowar Cove. 
Here you can see where the harder layer of rock that once protected the area from the sea has been broken down, forming a cove and St Oswald's Bay. A further two kilometres to the east is the beautiful Lulworth Cove, thought to be formed when glacial runoff broke through the concordant harder Portland and Purbeck limestone, allowing the sea to reach in and wash out the softer clays and green sands that lay behind. This clay eroded much more rapidly than the narrow entrance and rear cliff, with these being made of harder rock resulting in the formation of a beautiful circular cove. So many interesting features can be seen here, including notches that will grow in size and cause the collapse of the land above. Slumping of the land is also clearly visible at the rear of the cove. Areas of folding in the rock strata show places where the softer layers are being preferentially washed out and there's even a bed of ancient mussel shells in one of the layers. The narrow entrance to the sea has the effect of causing the incoming waves to diffract, spreading out in a circular pattern forming the cove. This also has the effect of reducing their overall destructive power. There will always be competing demands on the use of land, with the military still enclosing a large area stretching approximately 7 kilometres from Lulworth Cove to Kimridge Bay in the east. Tourism provides work and income for the local population, but with it comes the need for shops, cafes and restaurants, as well as traffic congestion. In places, the well-managed car park at Lulworth Cove looks larger than the cove itself. Paths widen and become more visible, so paving of these routes has been done to try and stem their uncontrolled growth and to reduce erosion caused by the increased footfall. The impact of increased visitor numbers to the area, nearly half a million a year, is clear to see so management and mitigation remains important to conserve the land in as natural a form as possible, remembering it's home to much important fauna and flora as well. Just to the west of Lulworth Cove is Stair Hole, where the hydraulic action of the waves and chemical reactions between the seawater and the limestone are slowly forming a new cove. Here also is the impressive Lulworth Crumple, part of the Purbeck monocline formed about 30 million years ago, consisting of impressive disharmonic folds in the rock strata. It is interesting to note that with the hard Portland limestone still mainly in place at its entrance, stair hole is not very visible from the sea yet. Whilst the formation of a cove is a slow process, as it grows, should any houses remain, they will almost certainly be lost to the sea. Seven kilometres to the east of Lulworth Cove, Kimridge Bay has an excellent example of a wave cut platform. Here, with no protection from a beach, the bay feels the full force of the sea. Hydraulic and chemical actions of the waves create wave cut notches at the base of the cliff, slowly resulting in the formation of a cave. The weakened rocks above the cave roof then collapse, leaving a flat platform. The Kimridge ledges stretch out into the sea and the area is the type locality for Kimridge clay, yielding outstanding quality fossils. Again, competing demands on the land are very evident here, with the large Lulworth military range with its ghost village of Tynham to the west of the bay. Access is restricted during firing, but the MOD has done what it can to allow controlled access to the area. 
visitors are instructed to keep to the clearly waymarked paths to avoid conflict with military exercises and lethal unexploded ordnance. It's worth noting that military land like this often offers a real haven for wildlife that would not fare so well in areas bustling with tourists, almost all of whom will use cars to access popular honeypot areas. On the cliffs above the bay is an unusual land use, oil extraction. A nodding donkey, one of the oldest working oil pumps in the UK, can be seen pumping oil up to the surface from the Kimmeridge oil field that lies over a third of a kilometre below the surface. Moving further east, we come to a discordant coastline where different rock types face out towards the sea and are being eroded at widely differing rates depending on how hard or soft they are. Swanage Bay is an excellent example of a discordant coastline where the soft clay and sands have been eroded by the wave action to create a bay with harder rocks such as chalk to the north and limestone to the south, resulting in headlands at Hanfast and Peveril points. The iconic Old Harry Stack and his wife, a stump, are located on the bay's northern chalk headland. Here, the harder chalk seam that runs all the way to the Isle of Wight has been so eroded that most of the rock has now disappeared from view, leaving behind a tall headland. What remains is a number of stacks and stumps where cracks which enlarge to caves through hydraulic action of the waves have finally seen their roofs fall in, leaving vertical stacks of chalk. Feeling the full force of the waves, these two will erode away in time due to the action of the waves, biological erosion and chemical erosion due to the salt water to form stumps. New Old Harry's will form in due course, Harry already having had a number of wives. Studland Bay to the north of Old Harry clearly shows the effect of the discordant coastline with a softer rock having been more rapidly worn away, leaving a huge bay. This process is also visible in a small steep-sided bay just to the west of Old Harry. Studland Bay has some extremely popular sandy beaches and a sensitive sand dune system that needs very careful management, often with opposing demands being made by man and nature. Moving east from the end of the Jurassic coast is Sandbanks. Positioned on a narrow spit of land at the entrance to Poole Harbour, it has a chain ferry that runs the short distance to South Haven Point, giving good visitor access to the beaches of Studland Bay. Heavily developed, it is known for its exclusive multi-million pound properties, the most exclusive of which line the seafront. Crucial to protecting Poole Harbour from the more powerful waves, it is very vulnerable to erosion and to sea level rise, and therefore needs a clear and effective shoreline management plan. Fourteen kilometres further east is Hengisbury Head, which clearly shows competing calls on the use of land. Consisting of a narrow spit enclosing Christchurch Harbour, it is home to a varied and important array of wildlife, and is designated not only as a triple SI, but also as a scheduled ancient monument due to the importance of its archaeological sites. It is also a very popular tourist location with smart and very expensive beach huts running most of its length. Motorised vehicles are banned, but the area does have a regular land train service. The harbour is used for sailing and boating and has a large number of moorings. Erosion is very much in evidence, accelerated by work previously done in Bournemouth on its coastal defences. Groins have been used to try and reduce longshore drift and the loss of the sandy beach. 
A revetment has been constructed along the cliff edge out of gabions. Metal cages filled with rock and riprap or rock armour has been positioned at the head of the spit to offer some protection to the cliffs and to reduce the power of the incoming and destructive waves. The use of the land by humans is clearly in evidence, but much is being done to contain the effect of this on what is a very popular tourist location. The area even used to be mined for ironstone that can still be found here. Starved of material caused by the construction of Bournemouth's coastal defences, Barton-on-Sea, built on soft clay and sediments, suffers from collapsing cliffs showing sliding and rotational slumping as it fails to receive material once eroded from cliffs to the west. There is a large standoff of land between the cliffs and the sea, but this in time will erode even further than it has already. Defences are in place in the form of rock groins and were the first to be used in England. Rock armour or riprap is in place designed to dissipate the power of the waves in an attempt to slow down erosion to the toe of the cliffs. Land drainage has also been needed as water from inland is also responsible for the weakening and erosion of the soft cliff material. Much less of a tourist area it is, however, still popular with those that own beach huts. Milford-on-Sea is suffering much the same fate as Barton-on-Sea, with slumping of its cliffs in some areas. It does retain a beach, a first line of defence, and have groins which help to protect the weak cliffs. Part of the shoreline management plan involves using regular beach replenishment to effectively hold the line for now, which will be followed by a policy of managed realignment. In other places, just to the west, the SMP involves no active intervention to effectively do nothing to protect that area from erosion. Finally, to the southeast of Milford on Sea is Hurst Spit, an approximately two kilometre long pebble shingle bank which protects both the western Solent and the salt marsh to its north. Partly formed by longshore drift, it has declined in volume since coastal defences constructed to the west starved it of material. Part of the stabilisation works installed a rock breakwater to the west as well as a rock revetment by Hearst Castle at its most eastern point, with the rock being brought in from Norway. The management plan also includes regular shingle nourishment, replenishment of the shingle to replace that which is lost and to limit the chances of breaches of the bank during large storms. This, however, has led to a structure that has lost its natural shape with unsorted pebbles unlike Chesil Beach, as well as it having suffered the ignominious fate of being described as looking less like a coastal feature and more like a railway embankment. There will always be human pressures on the land too, but whatever the shoreline management plan used, in the long term, nature will always win. <laughs>